Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Bill's lesson today is in Luke chapter 17, titled, The Grateful Are Rewarded. Well, Luke chapter 17 is where we find ourselves. We are studying through the book of Luke on Sunday mornings and making a journey. We're all the way in chapter 17. And uh, the story of uh, the experience that Jesus has with these uh, ten leprous men. A uh, cold wintry day in 1860, a tragedy took place in Lake Michigan. Uh, a steamer that was transporting people across the lake as it was drawing close to the dock had some kind of catastrophic failure, and uh, it began to sink. A uh, wintry day is, well, any day your boat begins to sink, you're in trouble, but a cold wintry day on Lake Michigan, talk about a really bad day. Uh, 1860, not a lot of people swam. Uh, a lot of people in the boat didn't know how to swim. A lot of people on the dock didn't know how to swim, and they were watching their loved ones, relatives, friends uh, drown. Uh, the few that could did, and one in particular, a guy by the name of Edward Spencer, risked his life, threw off his overcoat, swam out to the sinking ship 16 different times, according to the records, uh, saved in the process 17 different people. And so for his act of heroism, though, he uh, suffered uh, physically, permanently for the rest of his life. Uh, exposure, overexertion, you know, whatever it was, uh, it basically shortened his life. He didn't live too many years after that. And when he passed away, according to the local newspaper reporting who he was and you know, the wonderful thing that he had done, the sad part of the story was is that, according to everybody's recollection, none of the people who he had rescued, the 17 people, had ever come by personally to thank him. And uh, sad, right? Uh, sad. So not the reason why you do things, but it would be nice to hear. And it's sort of eerily... Uh, uh, similar to the story we're going to read here in the book of Luke, this, this incident that takes place as Jesus heals uh, these very sick men. Chapter 17, beginning in verse 11, says, It came about while he, Jesus, was on the way to Jerusalem, that he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. Like I said, he's been on his way to Jerusalem since chapter 9. It's only just three months between chapter 9 and chapter 19. And uh, in, those, in those three months and in those ten chapters, Luke records exactly five particular healings or miracles. Probably a lot more that he did, in fact, undoubtedly, but, uh, but five particular ones, and this is the fourth one. The last one's going to be blind, as we call him, blind Bartimaeus in Jericho, which is a couple of chapters away. But this is the fourth one, this, this healing, and, and as he's passing between Samaria and Galilee, and as he entered a certain village, ten leprous men stood at a distance met him. They raised their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Of course, the reputation of Jesus was, was prolific. He basically banned disease, uh, issues, demon possession from the land of Israel. Everyone, who, even the people that were just touching him were being healed. Of course, uh, you read the stories. One of the things we don't read, we read these particular miracles. We don't hear, we, don't hear, we, sh we should pay careful attention to where it says he entered this village and pre performed many miracles. He did this and performed many miracles. It wasn't just the ones that you know, these stories that have names, if you will, and faces. Uh, he, he, did, he, he basically, everywhere he went, no one came close to him that was not healed or, or delivered in some way. And so this is one of the particular ones, though, that we have uh, quite a bit of conversation with. So, so leprosy, if you're not familiar with it, very nasty, very deadly disease, also a very modern disease. It is with us today. It's not pr prominent as it was back then because there is cures for it. It's a, it's, it's a bacteria-borne disease. Uh, it is one of the oldest diseases. They've even found traces of, of leprosy in mummies that predate Christ by a thousand years. So it's one of the oldest uh, diseases uh, the world has been uh, dealing with it since the beginning. Today it's known as Hansen's disease, and it's only called that not because it's not leprosy anymore. It still is leprosy, but uh, Hansen is the guy who did the most research on it. He researched uh, people in India and in southern Africa who had this disease, and his we owe a lot to him, and therefore uh, to understand this disease that is, and, and therefore he's, it's named after him. One of the things he found out that's interesting about it is primarily acts as an anesthetic. The disease does. It just takes away your ability to feel. Uh, the nerve kills the nerve endings, especially in your extremities, but on, on your skin's surface. You could have a big gash in your arm and not know it. One of the stories he relates of a particular thing that happened in India, there was, uh, they were cooking around a campfire and a very hot potato fell off in the middle of the fire and the guy just stuck his hand in there, pulled it out. He said you, you, you couldn't smell the potato anymore because you could smell his roasting flesh. And the guy was just popped the potato open and started eating it. Couldn't feel it at all. 
So, you know, I mean, compared to all the diseases you could have, most of the diseases I know hurt. And that one does the opposite. But, but God has given us the ability to feel pain and a sense of touch and feel for a very good reason. And one of those reasons is demonstrated in, in um, this whole thing, Hansen's disease or leprosy. Because when you can't feel heat or cold or uh, you can't feel, they can't feel fractures or sprains or injuries of any kind. So, so you damage yourself and you don't even know it. And which leads, of course, to infection, which leads to further issues. And this is the reason why, well, you know, uh, famously, uh, uh, Hansen's or, or leprosy is known for people losing their fingers and their toes and their ears and their noses and stuff like that because that's what happens. You get injured and, and you don't know you're injured. Uh, Hansen, again, described a guy who, who broke his ankle, who just just limped along like nothing. He just learned to walk a different way because his ankle was now broke. No big deal. Didn't, didn't hurt him at all. Uh, strange disease, very odd and very sad. Uh, transmitted through touch. You're probably familiar with that. Transmitted if, even if you come in contact with the clothing that the person was wearing. Also is transmitted through the air. You can breathe it in. And so, of course, in the old days, there was no cure. Today we have antibiotics. Back then, they didn't have it. And so if you caught... Uh, leprosy, you were segregated for the rest of your life, your natural life, uh, away from family and friends till the day that you died. So it's sad physically and it's also sad emotionally and, and socio sociologically because you have this, it was the only way they knew how to deal with it. And so you can understand the, the desperation of these men as they come to Jesus. Master, please have mercy on us. Verse 14, and when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And that's a little odd. I don't know, if it, I don't know about y'all, but I was thinking, you know, shouldn't we pray first? You know, I mean, shouldn't we kind of pull out the anointing oil? I don't know what we need to do here. It wouldn't be, you know, I would think that he would have done something differently because you go see the priest, that's Old Testament rules, because you went to see the priest after you had been healed. Of course, on the way, if you know the story we're going to see, on the way they get healed, but they leave his presence unhealed and be like, now wait a minute, we just got to Jesus. Let's make sure we don't leave here until, you know, stuff's taken care of. But Jesus says, no, go show yourself to the priest. Reminds me of the story in the Old Testament of another leprous person by the name of Naaman. Remember the story? He was a Syrian, and he heard that in Israel there was a prophet named Elisha who, who, through whom God did great miracles and healings. And of course, like I said, this terminal disease and horrible way to live. He goes and finds his way to Elisha's house, but when he comes and asks for Elisha to come out and pray over him or anoint him or do something or ask God to, to, to heal him or whatever, Elisha doesn't even come to the door, just sends his servant. And his servant says, Elisha told me to tell you to go dip yourself seven times in the Jordan River. And the guy was offended by it. Well, I've traveled all this way. I'm an important person. Surely he would have come out and put his hand on me or waved his hand or said a prayer or anyway. It's interesting. It's, it's, a, it's an assumption with regards to these men. I would assume that somehow they would have thought, well, wow, that's not what I thought he would say or what he thought he would do. And many times that's our problem. Uh, we come to God for help, and then we want to just tell God exactly how he's going to help us, and that's not how it works. If you're in need of help, then obviously you can't help yourself. So don't go about telling God how he's going to do things. Uh, his ways are right and good and and uh, maybe mysterious in some ways. So he sends them off to the priest, and of course on the way uh, they are healed, it says there in verse 14. And, and as they were going, uh, they were cleansed. It says now one of them, and of course the whole good that happens to the ten is eclipsed by the fact that the nine, nine of the ten don't go back. They just simply can't find their way back to the healer to say thank you, which is super sad. So it goes from a happy story to in some ways a sad story. One of them, it says, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to Jesus, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus answered, were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? And was no one found who turned back to give glory to God except this foreigner? He said to them, said to him, rise, go your way, your faith has made you, literally saved you. So, so these guys, if you will, the, the other nine, got, got, got healed, but not really rescued. This guy, in the healing, finds the rescuer. He goes back, because of what good is a miracle if you don't know the miracle worker? You see, sometimes we, we come to God for things, and we think that's all that we need, and God's saying, listen, this is the least that you need. Because I don't know if you know about these nine. Have you ever met these guys, by the way? Of course not, because guess what? 
They didn't die from leprosy, but they did die from something else. You see, the, the fact is, you, we need to have eternity in our minds at all times. So yeah, I need this temporary miracle, and that's all it's going to ever be, by the way. This temporary healing, that's all it's going to ever be, because you're eventually passing out of this life. So, so are you ready to meet truly your maker? You ready to meet the, it's, it's one thing for the miracle, it's another thing to know the miracle worker, and this Samaritan got it right. See, his heart of gratitude sent him back because he knew better than, I don't just need healing, I need to know the healer. But what kept these guys from their healer was ultimately their ingratitude. And again, uh, such a sad story, and it, it begs the question of why didn't they go back? What got the one guy there and kept the other guys away? And it's speculation because the scriptures don't answer that question. But I'd be willing to bet with a little bit of speculation on our part, we could find reasons among ourselves why we wouldn't have gone back. Say, oh, I would never be that, Pastor. Okay, well, I hope not. But let's see if we can't come up with some possible reasons that might have kept us away and it may keep us today from giving thanks to him for the blessings that he brings into his life. I want to give uh, credit to a pastor by the name of Chuck Sly. Do you know Chuck Sly? S-L-I-G-H? Me neither. But I was reading his stuff. <laughs> and I was preparing this sermon. I started looking at his sermon and his stuff. I was like, man, his, my, my sermon is very similar to his stuff. So I want to give him credit for the point, some of these points here because he made some excellent ones and I'm going to throw them out to you. Why, why didn't these guys return to Jesus? Well, number one, maybe it's because they didn't, they didn't go back because it wasn't convenient. I mean, Jesus heals them. They're on the way to the priest. Maybe they've walked miles in that direction. So, so you immediately get healed, what do you think of? Where's my wife? Where's my kids? Where's my friends? Where's my family? My hometown? They've been lepers for a while, maybe years. But, but, but the only one who has sense enough to know how it really works is the Samaritan. So you know those things matter, and we'll get to those things, but what really matters is the one who healed me. What really matters, not the miracle, not the healing, but the healer, the miracle worker. It, it wasn't convenient for them. Because they had other things to do, and that's the way it is when it comes to gratitude. Gratitude is never convenient. It just never is. I can tell you this for sure. If you're waiting for gratitude to become convenient, you're not a grateful person. It just will never be convenient. It's never convenient when someone does something for you, for you to write a card to say, or to go out of your way to say thank you. It, it takes time away from something else you could possibly be doing. Like I said, these people could go see their friends. They could go see their family. They've been without them for a long time. It is, uh, the scripture says in Hebrews that, that uh, calls praise a sacrifice. We bring a sacrifice of praise. What is a sacrifice? It costs you something. It, it's, it's, exp it's sometimes more expensive than others. It, it's an expense, if you will, to bring gratitude to God. It will not be convenient for you. And if you're waiting, well, then you never will be grateful. If you're waiting for it to be convenient for you. Well, it won't be. It won't be convenient for you. Of course, I'm here preaching to the choir. It won't be convenient for you to come to church on a regular basis. If you're waiting for it to be convenient, I can tell you, you don't come very often, do you? Because <laughs> it's not convenient. It's not convenient. You, you think it's, uh, you know, and they say, oh, well, you get paid to be up there. Well, and I do get a salary, and I'm really, really appreciative of that. But I can tell you some Sundays, I don't, really don't want to come. I'd rather stay home and watch it on television myself. <laughs> but I praise God I don't have that privilege because there'd be a lot of days I'm just like, you know what, I don't feel very good today. I don't feel like it. I don't like half the people up there anyway. And so I'm not coming. <laughs> <laughs> or I don't think they like me. <laughs> Do it, doing what's right is inconvenient. Re returning thanks and praise to God will always be, in this life, inconvenient for us. It'll be inconvenient for you to, to, to spend the time that you need with God every day in prayer, in Bible study. If you're waiting for it to be convenient, you will not do it. That's why you're doing it here and there, because you're waiting for convenience, and I'm already burst a bubble for you now. I'm telling you, it'll never be convenient for you. You, you don't fit. God doesn't fit into your life. You fit into him. So find a way to fit him in. Make a spot. If you say God matters, well then, does it have priority on your daily calendar? Does He? It'll never be convenient. It'll always be a cost. Praise always costs us something. Gratitude always costs us something. These guys didn't go back because it was too inconvenient for them. Another reason possibly why they didn't go back, these nine, is because they were too proud. You know, gr gratitude is humbling. 
Gratitude is me saying to you, I needed you and you helped me out. And that says one thing about me, I was needy. And people don't like to say that. I've got it all together. No, you don't. No one does. The reason why we bring gratitude is because that person helped you when you needed help or God helped you when you needed help. God came through and we bring gratitude back to him. But part and parcel with that is to say, I don't have it all together. I don't have it all figured out. I don't have everything in, lined up and, and I never will. And it's hard. It's hard. To say that, it's hard. Pride keeps us from so many things we talked about last week. If you can swear off of anything in 2023, let it be pride. Let it be pride because the scripture has so much to say, problems that it's going to bring into your life, as it says there, James 4. God resists the proud. You just don't need that. Simple solution. Humble yourself. He gives grace to the humble. Notice, that's, that's not just miracles. That's bigger than miracles. See, that's what this man realized. I, I don't need just a temporary healing he's going to die from something else anyway right i need the grace of god and i need to go back to the one who dispenses that grace and give gratitude and thanks where gratitude and thanks are deserved we really need humility we really do in every area of our lives we really do that's why we need to be thankful in every area every little we're talking about these kids your hair your clothes your shoes your car the air conditioning, the warm weather, I'm sure you're being thankful for that. Uh, the other things, I mean, we, we so desperately need to just make a huge laundry list. Grateful for this, I'm thankful for this, I'm thankful for this, I'm thankful for the struggles, I'm thankful for the, tr the trials. Because look at what it's done for me. Made me a better person. I read a story similar to this that relates to this of a, of a soldier who relates the story of his experience with a humble man in Wiesbaden, Germany. He was, he was um, an army GI uh, station in Germany. Anybody here stationed in Wiesbaden? Anybody? Where are you, Edward? Where were you? Anheim. Anheim, okay. Nobody else in Wiesbaden? I think Tracy's next. Tracy, are you next door? Hi, Tracy. This is her third time to listen to my sermons. I think Tracy's trying to figure out if, I've, if, if, I, do, if, if I say the same thing every time. I don't know. <laughs> she was in Wiesbaden. You were in Wiesbaden, weren't you? Weren't you? My dad was stationed in Wiesbaden, Wiesbaden, Germany. I've been there, actually. I stayed on the Rhine there uh, one time. But anyway, the story goes, uh, this GI uh, just got enlisted, just sent to Germany, stationed there, and uh, joined a Christian, joined the local English-speaking church, and noticed that one of his ranking officers, higher-ranking officers, was a deacon inside that church. And this guy was, was, was a big dude, I mean, in the sense of his importance. Very high security clearance, uh, was an expert in the Russian language. Of course, that was all... Uh, key, and still is, I guess, key uh, in that part of the world, in our world today. And uh, he was in the Sunday school class, men's Sunday school class, and this man was a part of the Sunday school class, and the teacher called on this man, this particular high-ranking officer, to pray. And he said, I don't know what I was expecting from the guy, but it wasn't what I got. He said, I was expecting some kind of very educated, very precise, very theologically, I don't know, detailed uh, prayer. He said, I'm not sure what I was expecting, but he says, it definitely wasn't what I heard. He says, as soon as I shut my eyes, I heard this guy pray these words. Dear Jesus, thank you for the grass. Thank you for the trees. Thank you for our houses, for our clothes, for our cars, for our coats, for that keep us warm. He said, I opened my eyes thinking, is that the same guy? That I, <laughs> no. Is this guy for real? And he said, of course, stationed there for years, he says, I came to realize, no, this, you know, yeah, at work, he's a, he's a bigwig. But when it comes to your relationship with God, he's humble. He humbles himself. We so desperately need to be grateful in everything because we need humility in everything. Maybe that's what kept them away. Maybe number three, the thing that kept them away is because just, doesn't Jesus know that we're thankful? Doesn't he know? Oh, well, we don't need to go back. I mean, he's the son of God. He can heal us out of, the, out of thin air. He knows what, how we feel. Doesn't he? He sure he does. Yeah, but it reminds me of the story of Billy and Viola. You know that story, right? You know the story of Billy and Viola? So Viola says to Billy, do you love me? You know that story? Viola says to Billy, do you love me? And Billy says, of course I love you. Don't you remember 40 years ago when we got married, I said I love you, and if it ever changes, I'll let you know. You know that story. Change the names, it's the same. It is good to know things, right? But it's also nice to not be taken for granted. We take God for granted when we don't thank Him. We take Him for granted. You say, oh, what's the use of thanking Him for the grass and the trees? Well, He doesn't have to add those things into your life. He doesn't have to enable you to see them or experience them. 
It doesn't have to do anything good for you. It'd be worth your time to thank him and not take him for granted for these things. And also when you consider those who are taking him for granted, isn't, it, isn't the world living in a common grace? We live in a world that has absolutely no, no thanks for God. I mean, no time for God. No place for God in their lives. God is a servant who does what we want, and when we don't, when he doesn't do what we want, well, then we reject him, we push him off to the side. That's the way the most of the world lives. You and I as Christians have been called to be two things, sight, uh, light and salt. Light and salt means when the whole world's dark, we bring the light. When the whole world's rotten, we bring the thing that keeps it from rotting. So when it comes to gratitude, that our, the, the weight should fall, not just shut, it does fall on us. The whole world is experiencing His grace. They're shaking their fists at heaven, and yet they're still alive. Still got their jobs. A roof over their heads. Why? Because God is being gracious to them, even when they don't thank Him. So, so when it comes our turn, are we doing any different than that? Any better than that? So, so the world's all messed up, and it's all dark, and you and I, it comes our turn to say thank you. And when we do, it's the single face that's turned upward, saying all that is good is because of him. Because it's true. Because it's true. We complain about how bad the world is, but are we doing our part in our place where we find ourselves to make it what, what we're responsible for, to make it right? Gratitude makes it right. Maybe a fourth thing. They didn't go back because they could think of other things that weren't, they weren't grateful for. It's interesting, of all that we get all kinds of blessings, we can think of other stuff that didn't work out. Like, for instance, their sorry friends who didn't show up to see them there, maybe in their leper colony. Or their, their kids who grew up and got too busy to come see them. My, yeah, he healed me, but my, I'm mad at people for thus and such. And let me just tell you this. Uh, bitterness is a problem, and here's, here's what I know about bitterness. Bitterness and thanksgiving can't be in the same life at the same time. So, so I can tell this about you, and I'm not trying to stick the knife in and twist it on you, but I'm going to do it. You show me a bitter person, I will show you an ungrateful person. Show me a grateful person, I'll show you a person who's walking away from bitterness. It's a choice you have to make. It's so incredibly important that we forgive because it keeps us from so many other things. It focuses our lives, among other things, on the things that we wish could be different, as in the case of these men, possibly. But you cannot have thanksgiving and bitterness coexisting in the same person. Decide which one you're going to be. We really need to do. Really need to do that. And then a the final thing possibly kept these men away. They didn't go back because they felt sorry for themselves. Yeah, we'd be elated. Well, yeah, I know, this is probably a stretch. But, but it's more, not so much a stretch when I think about me or maybe you, I don't know. Maybe they had been lepers for a long time, 15, 20 years. So yeah, yeah, I'm healed, but why didn't he heal me 15 years ago? Why didn't he do that? It's, it's sad, but true, is it not, that we tend to count our blessings on a hand, one, two, three, four, five, but we count our complaints on a calculator, times 10, times 100, Right? It's crazy. When, when everything we have that's good has come from God. Yeah, he healed me, but he could have done it a long time ago. There was a plaque on the wall of a sick ward many years ago that, that so should speak to us. And I want to read to you uh, what it said. It tells us how, how we need to be so careful and, and how we miss out on so many blessings by not realizing the blessings that we already have. Here's, here's what it said. It says, I ask God for strength that I might achieve... I was made weak that I might learn to humbly obey. I asked God for health that I might do great things, but I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked God for riches that I might be happy, but I was given want that I might be wise. They asked God for power that I might have praise or of others, but I was given weakness that I might feel the need for God. I asked God, I asked for all things that I might enjoy life, but I was given life that I might enjoy all things. So he goes on to say, I got nothing I asked for, but everything I hoped for. See, that's the way God works. And when we don't thank him, now we don't see it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer put it this way. He says, it's only in gratitude, in a, only with gratitude that life becomes truly rich. 
Yeah, you've got all this stuff, but it's not about what God's bringing into your life. It's about Him. See, the, the, the Samaritan got it right. Well, what's the use of this healing if you don't know who the healer is? What's the use of the blessings if we don't know who the blesser is? I read a story of a lady who employed Thanksgiving into her life and how, how radically it changed her. She was just down and out. Uh, she had given up a wonderful career where she made a lot of money and was considered a very important person in order to stay home with her kids. And a respectful decision, but it also meant a lot of things for her and a lot of things for her husband. It cut their salaries and their income in half and a lot of other problems uh, that it brought. And she was a couple of years into that and feeling kind of sorry for herself and feeling unneeded and feeling like this wasn't, there's so many other things I could be doing with my life and all these things. And she had a friend who challenged her and the friend said, basically, you're, you're bitter because you're not grateful. You have so many blessings, so many things that other people would love to have. But, 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 and and you're, 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 you're wishing for stuff that you don't have. Yeah, okay, but you have so many blessings. Learn to be grateful. And she challenged her. And this is a challenge that you may have, maybe ought to take. You want to walk away from bitterness and into gratitude. She challenged her. She said, you have a phone with a camera. Take a picture every day of something you're grateful for. It's not a hard challenge. Take a picture every day of something that you're grateful for. And so she did. It was her husband's night to cook. He cooked on an irregular basis, but she was cooking. He was cooking that night. And she felt like she was being grateful for him. But, but she, of course, you know, he serves the dinner and she takes a picture. And she noticed reviewing the picture later on in the week that he had cut her the bigger slice of pie. And then she started thinking about it and she started watching and she noticed that without telling her, he did, it, did that every single time. She said, how did I miss that? I have a great husband. She said, it's not that I didn't know I had a great husband. I didn't see what he was doing, though, for me. He wasn't asking for that. He, was, he loves me, and I'm so grateful for that. And I, now I can see it. And she began to change her attitude toward her kids. Instead of seeing her kids as someone who taken away from a very important job, she saw her kids as a very important job. Instead of just taking the pictures when they look cute, you know, we're dressing right, it was about you know, once, a, once a month or something. She began to take pictures no matter what they did. Crying, sleeping, uh, holding their hands out to her. Uh, pictures when she's in the bathroom of little fingers reaching underneath the door. You know, we've got moms back there. They know, they know what we're talking about. If you've been a mom, a dad. And, and she began to thank God for it. She's thinking, how many people don't have kids? Wish they could. Or have a kid and have lost them, or have other experiences in life, and they would so much. I mean, she said, I'm missing these opportunities to be grateful to God, and it radically changed her life. She said nothing got better. I mean, technically, nothing changed, but she changed because of gratitude. So, so, so hear me on this. Our riches aren't whatever God brings into our lives. Our riches are knowing Him. And when we know Him and are grateful for Him, then... It's not until then we become rich. I'm going to ask if you would bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we think about what God has said to us today. I wonder there with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, have you missed the healer? Have you missed the blesser? It's the one thing to want the healing and the miracle and whatever God brings. And, and God's great. And God's good to us. But, but a horrible thing that when God does these things in our lives for us, like these men, to miss the healer. What good is the healing without the healer? What good is the blessing without the blesser? The Bible maintains, and we do as well, that you have to have a personal encounter with Jesus. A personal encounter where you trust Him as Savior. It's not enough to know that He is the Savior. Okay, Jesus died on the cross. You know the story to pay for our sins, but have you accepted what he did? That, that's personal. That's personal. This, this guy, this Samaritan, made it personal because that's what it is. It's you and the Savior. It's you and the healer. It's you and the miracle worker. Have you had a personal encounter with him? Whether, whether it's leprosy or something else, you're, you're not getting out of this alive. Do you know the only one who can save you? From, from a fate worse than death. From, from a fate of paying for your own sins. The one who paid for those sins. His name is Jesus. You have to have a personal encounter with him. Not enough to be in church. We're glad you're here. 
not enough to do good things or read the Bible or, or, or pray. But have you had a personal encounter with Jesus and acknowledged him, trusted him, saying, Jesus, I, I trust you as my Savior. I, I ask you to forgive me of my sins and to apply your everlasting life to me. Have you prayed a prayer like that? Maybe you need to today. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have blessed us in so many ways. Forgive us, God, how we just go through life with all of these riches and we're not able to be rich in them because of our lack of gratitude, because we're focused on other things or because we're bitter about stuff that we wish were different. God, forgive us. God, refocus us, we ask. That in this dark world there might be a light on in our lives, faces turned upward to you, as much as it's possible with us making it right. We trust you, God. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.